Hello and welcome to today's episode of This Is Automation Live. I'm your host, Corey Dallas, and I'm very happy to have you with me today to talk about robots. So today we're gonna be answering the question, how do robot arms work? Before we get into that, I do appreciate all of you out there that have subscribed. And if you haven't done that, uh, go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below. And if you like the video, just leave me a thumbs up at the end. You don't have to do it now. Wait and see if it's actually worth your time. And then leave a like, leave a comment. I do try to respond to all of those comments. So thank you again, and let's get started. So before we talk about the underlying uh, details of how a robot arm works, I wanted to first talk about the physical kinematics of the robot. So the kinematics is basically just the, the actual mechanical components that are connected together and how they're connected together with these joints. Now in a tip, typical articulated arm robot like the one we're looking at on our screen, there are gonna be six axes or six degrees of freedom is another way you may hear it referred to. Now that just means that there's six different ways that this robot can move. And at each of these degrees of freedom, there is gonna be a motor in a typical modern robot. Um, some of the older ones uh, were hydraulic and you may even see some pneumatic applications, but in most cases, this is going to be an electric motor. If you wanna learn a little bit more about how those electric motors work, we do have a series on motor basics that you can go check out, but we're not gonna talk about that in this video. So again, each uh, degree of freedom here is going to have a motor in it in, in a modern robot, and it's gonna allow the robot to move in different ways. And Ultimately, the end goal is, is to control the way that the robot moves intelligently, and that's either gonna be on a point-to-point -point basis where we don't really care how it gets there as long as it gets to that point, or on a path control basis, that's gonna be really important for applications like cutting, welding, where it's really important that it follows a very specific path. So we'll talk about those in a little bit, but let's first jump through each of these joints so that we can have a good basis of knowledge. So joint one, this is gonna be called the S axis in, in most cases, also referred to as joint one sometimes. Swing, base, there's a bunch of different names for these. I'll try to put them on the screen so that you have a, a good reference. This is gonna control the swing of the robot, so kind of the base um, of the robot. Moving up to joint two, this is often called the L axis, lower arm or shoulder, so you can kind of think of this as you know analogous to the human arm in a lot of ways. Um, and this would be you know, this joint right here, your, your shoulder joint, okay? Joint three, uh, also called the U-axis, upper arm or elbow. This works very similarly to your elbow. It's another revolute joint. Uh, so again, just like on your elbow, this is just a revolute joint that is, is going to move everything beyond it. Okay, number four, we call this one the R-axis, sometimes joint four the arm or forearm rotation. Again, very similar to the human arm. This is kind of the easiest way to explain it because you have one too uh, in most cases. And this is going to be the rotation of the arm. So something like this. All right, number five, this uh, part of the robot is often called the wrist. Again, for very obvious reasons. Um, and this B axis joint five here is wrist bend. So there's, there's two motions that the wrist can do. One is a bend, the other one is a rotation. So when we say wrist bend, we're talking about this kind of movement here. Okay, so it's, a, it's another revolute joint. And then the last joint, we would call that the T-axis, in most cases, joint six, or wrist rotation. So this would be a rotation independent of joint four that we looked at earlier, um, whereas four we call, you know, the forearm or arm rotation. Six is an additional rotational axis that uh, just rotates the wrist itself. So again, if we've got our entire forearm, that would move everything down, and then we've got just the wrist. Hard for me to do that as a human, but um, hopefully you get the idea. So those are the six joints that make up the standard articulated arm robot, but how do we know which one to move in order for the robot to do what we want it to do? So let's come back to the point that we were talking about earlier and classify the movements in a couple different ways. The first one is a point-to-point -point movement. In a point-to-point -point movement, we're really just trying to move from point A to point B. It's pretty simple. So we're here in, in space, uh, as far as the tool center point is typically what we're talking about here. And we just wanna move it over here or over here. So we wanna start here, we wanna go here. We don't care if it goes this way or if it goes this way or if it's a straight line, we just want to move to that point. So that's what we call a point-to-point -point movement or path independent in some cases. Now, the, the kind of opposite to that would be a path-controlled movement. Now, this is uh, 
a lot of robotics applications tend to be path controlled movements because it's often very important um, not just that we are moving to a specific point but that we are moving there in a specific way if that makes sense so let's consider a welding application for example now we want to start here and end uh, maybe up here but we want to follow a very specific path in, in a welding application. Uh, for example, if, if we're trying to weld a piece of metal that looks something like this, it's very important that we follow that contour and don't just go straight across. So that's where path controlled movements can come into play. Um, this can also um, have some additional complications if you're looking at safe movement uh, or any sort, sort of safe workspaces within this, then the robot's gonna have to make sure that any calculated movement that it makes is not going to enter into that safe space and that can uh, create some, some additional complexities, but we won't talk too much about that today. So how does it actually do this? How does it generate these movement profiles? Well, that's what we call motion planning or path planning. It's a relatively complicated topic, actually with a lot of math underneath it. Um, so we're not gonna talk too much about that math today or at all really, um, but there's just a couple terms that I wanna get you familiar with so that you can kind of understand how this is happening in the back end. So one of those, uh, or two of those terms rather, are forward kinematics and inverse kinematics. This is one of the key foundations of how this technology works um, because ultimately we need to be able to translate between our end effector or tool center point position and the positions of the joints. Now with forward kinematics, it's pretty easy if we know all of our joint positions, it's pretty easy for us to say where we are in space as far as the tool center point. Now, something that is a little bit more complicated is, okay, we know the position that we want to be at of our tool center point. Now let's uh, back calculate, so to speak, our joint positions so that we know how to move those individual joints in aggregate to make the movement that we wanna make. So again, there's a lot of math behind that, but just know that when you hear those words, forward kinematics and verse kinematics, that's what it's talking about. And they play an integral role in this motion planning or path planning that your robot controller or PLC is doing. Okay, so let's talk about the key components that uh, make this actually happen. Um, again, for the typical automation uh, application, you're going to be writing code for the robot, some sort of program or command. Um, this could be G code, or it could be something different. Um, there's lots and lots of different ways to program, uh, but ultimately that is going to get interpreted. And then from there, it's gonna go into a path planner. So we interpret the programs uh, or commands that are given by the user or by some other interface. And then from there, we're putting that into the path planner. And what the path planner is doing is taking that list of commands uh, or a list of lines in the program and defining a geometric path. Okay, so we are telling it what to do. The interpreter is, is taking that and uh, converting it into a, a more friendly uh, uh, form for the path planner. And then the path planner is taking that in defining the geometric path. In there, there's also some tool compensation that can happen uh, in, in some cases if we need to, to offset the positions, and then also defining the path velocity um, because that can be important. And then from there, once the path planner knows what the path looks like after all of the compensations, then we're actually going to generate the path. And so the path generator is basically gonna be generating cyclic position set points for each axis. So that's where those transformations become really important. We know what the, the geometry looks like. Now we have to, um, using you know inverse kinematics, understand what each joint needs to do in order to make that motion at the tool center point happen. So that's where our path generator is gonna be generating these cyclic position set points for each of those different axes, the motors on those axes. And from there, we'll hopefully see the motion that we're expecting. So let's talk about how that works from a communication standpoint, because in some cases a robot is standing alone, but in a lot of cases, there's other control happening in that system. So there's some communication with the PLC. Uh, maybe the PLC is just controlling a robot cell, or maybe it's a larger machine or a line. So what's typical is that you have a PLC vendor uh, and a robot vendor, and that PLC vendor is going to kind of own one side of the solution. The robot vendor is gonna own the other side. So on the PLC side, you've got you know, your PLC, your IO cards, your HMI, and then on the robot vendor side, there's typically another controller, a dedicated robot controller with the motor drives inside of it, and usually a teach pendant or some sort of HMI, and then the actual physical robot itself, the actual manipulator with the motors and encoders. 
Now, the connection between that uh, can vary. It kind of depends. Again, sometimes a robot can just stand alone and, and run on its own, but very often we do want some communication with the PLC. So that could be a field bus. Um, you know, the, the common ones would be like PowerLink, Ethernet IP, Profinet, those sorts of uh, Ethernet based protocols. You could have uh, serial protocols uh, back and forth and you could even have some sort of discrete communication. So really it's, it's kind of like connecting anything to a PLC. There's a few different ways to do it and virtually all of those are supported by robot vendors. Now, again, when we talk about where the control sits, it's often in that robot controller for, for the robot itself. And maybe the PLC is just acting as a high level sequencer, but there are some uh, cases where it makes sense for the PLC to take more control of the robot. So in that case, it may be streaming positions to the robot controller in some cases, uh, or even telling the robot controller which functions to execute. So this can get a little complicated. There are some alternative uh, architectures out there. ABB and BNR have this architecture, for example. Uh, this is what they call the machine-centric robotics. Um, this one is a little different from the last one because here you have kind of a hybrid PLC and robot vendor. So instead of having two discrete systems that you're trying to communicate between, this is one system controlling the robot. Um, so here you've got the PLC that's actually doing all of that work that we were talking about before, and then dedicated servo drives that again would, would come from the PLC manufacturer that are controlling the different axes and taking the encoder signal from the robot. So this is a really interesting uh, application because it consolidates everything into one vendor, uh, which, which can have some distinct advantages. And then it also consolidates the software platform and communications because it's all uh, nicely coupled into, into one ecosystem. So those are two of the most common implementations of the actual PLC communication architecture. Again, depending on the application, one or the other may be better, or depending on you know, some of the other requirements uh, of that application, if you already have the robot, for example, you may be stuck uh, with, with one certain way, or you have a certain type of robot that only supports a certain type of communication, you may have to uh, either use some sort of communication gateway or select a PLC that's going to be able to support that. So hopefully that makes sense. Today we talked about the basis of the kinematics, which would be the different joints in the system. So we talked about the six axis articulated arm robot. There's tons of other types of robots out there, your deltas, your scaras, so on and so forth, um, that use very much the same principles. Then we talked about how we know which one of those joints to move in order to get a specific movement. And there's two different type, types of movements. We looked at point to point and path dependent. Now the underlying uh, kind of back into that is the motion planning or path planning where we're looking through our interpreter and then into the path planning and then into the path generation. So from there, that's how we get from, you know, human readable code into actually using those inverse kinematics to tell our robot motors which way to go and which position to be at which time. And that's ultimately gonna give us the output that we expect at the end of arm tooling or at the tool center point. So that's how robot works. Uh, it's pretty, pretty simple um, at a high level, but you can definitely get into the weeds a little bit when we talk about some of those kinematic transformations as well as the motion planning and path planning. So as abstract as possible, just to give you the concept. But if you wanna know more, uh, leave a comment. I'd be happy to put together a video to talk about more details behind that. But of course, just let me know if you have any questions or comments. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on This Is Automation. Thanks.